you're pandering to this middle ground. Okay, everybody, kumaya, just get along. Jesus is coming back. How are we going to labor? How are we going to work together if we have this acidic, corrosive element coming in at the right core foundation? If we're now taking worldviews and our worldview is different and being swapped out. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and we're talking about the SBC presidential race. It's a crucial one. What's good with it? What's bad with it? What these candidates believe? Let's look. All right. Say good morning, coffee. Hi. My assistant. He's always trustworthy. So the presidential race, allergies, sorry, are is heating up, if you will. Uh, there's been a number of different interviews. I was able to interview uh, Tom Askell with another gentleman on his channel, uh, Bobby Gilstrap. He interviewed all three candidates this year and all four last year. Uh, you can find that link uh, in the description, and I'll put it up at the top as well. And it was a good interview. Uh, there were rapid fire questions. There were several other questions. There were questions actually that were like 65 or so uh, people from different churches in the SBC and so on and, and supporters of the channel. Some people I brought questions over as well and contributed. I wasn't able to participate with the other two, uh, Bart Barber and uh, Robin Hathaway. This is at a church in Texas. We'll get to it. But Tom Askell is the biggest name. And of course, he's the found the founder of Founders Ministry, and he's been a large, big name supporter of being biblical and not wokey, not social justicey. So let's just get after it. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 um, SBC Presidential Candidate Forum. My name is Tony Richmond. I'm one this of the is just an intro here, here. First Baptist Keller, and I'm joined by a doctor. It'll be three minutes each. But uh, for these first five minutes, we'll start with Bart and then go to Robin and then to Tom. So Bart, take us. So first guy, if you're looking at the screen, is Bart Barber. Second guy, Robin Hathaway. Last guy, third guy, Tom Askell from left to right. Wait. Well, good morning. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I was uh, born in Lake City, Arkansas, uh, came to know Christ when I was very young in the Bethabra Baptist Church, uh, which was outside Lake City. You get some kind of an idea of when a town you've never heard of in Arkansas is the nearest big place that you refer to uh, to talk about where you uh, grew up. You get some idea about the size of it. Uh, it was a church, though, where the gospel was preached, and I heard it and, and uh, accepted Christ at that tender age and was baptized, not in one of those uh, store-bought baptistries, but something somebody had built uh, to hold water and uh, was baptized there when I was young uh, at an associational children's camp, boys camp. Uh, God called me to preach. Uh, once I don't think knew what to do with an 11-year-old uh, who had come to say God had called him to preach, but, uh, but I was sure about it. And uh, it was only a few years later We're gonna go a little faster. that I preached my first sermon 17 that I led my first church and um, uh, got blessed through that. And I've been at First Baptist Farmersville for uh, 23 years. Um, uh, if, um, uh, if anything's been true in all of that, it's just been that God's been faithful uh, down through the years to, uh, to, to help me grow and to, and to lead me. And I just want to give praise to him for uh, the way he's been close to me. Okay. So, yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, got saved, you know, probably at like four or something crazy. Uh, again, sorry. Uh, okay. Cool, cool. Uh, called to preach at 11, and he's pastoring at 17. So he's been a pastor like, you know, decades and decades and decades. Uh, so far, though, this isn't a very good, in my estimation, uh, as I say. Uh, he's he's really stammering and stuttering. This is the first question. So, yeah. Um, the other questions that were asked, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, I've uh, uh, allowed my name to be put forward as a nominee for the presidency of the SBC, basically because I just came to the end of my stubbornness. Uh, there are people in this room who to do that a number of times uh, down through the years. Uh, I've always said no. I've always had reasons I wanted to say no. Um, and uh, yet at this uh, at this moment in the life of our convention, uh, the number of people 
me to do that greatly intensified. And as I prayed about it, uh, we came to um, a conclusion that now was the time to, to go ahead and say okay to that. Um, I've spoken with my church about that. Uh, I think it would be difficult for me. To, I, we've got changes coming to the way that the president of the SBC operates any way that you go, because all three of our candidates this time are not pastors of really, really large churches. And uh, I was talking to Brother Jimmy Draper. and That's a good point. All these guys are pastors or Robert Hathaway is a professor. He's a church planter, international mission missionary. Uh, J.D. Greer and even Lytton, J.D. Greer especially, and uh, Steve Gaines, he's the pastor of Bellevue Baptist where Adrian Rogers was years ago. Adrian Rogers was, he was a pastor, massive church then in the 70s and 80s. Steve Gaines, of course, it's a huge church. I was just down in Memphis a couple weeks ago. Massive church, massive church, huge, huge church, building, church building and congregation, right? And then J.D. Greer, also multi-site campus, all this other stuff. And so this is what we need. We need pastors or a pastor who is the president of the convention of a church that's a normal sized church, maybe not a tiny church, you know, but church of 300, 500, 1,000. Those are average normal sized churches. These 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 sized churches. No, no. Uh, he was saying that uh, in the two years that he was president, he, he traveled 300,000 miles. Uh, but the Constitution of the Southern Baptist Convention doesn't actually require the president to do that. And uh, so uh, I've spoken with my church about uh, acceptable limits to time away and speaking engagements. I know what the constitutional expectations are of the president of the SBC, and uh, we're confident that we can meet those expectations. Um, and so we've spoken about all of that. And then the last thing, as far as what can be accomplished, uh, I think it's important for you to know in a week when we're talking about the American Constitution, about strict construction, this interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, leading us to do wonderful things like strike down Roe v. Wade, uh, that I'm... Okay. Get that. Talking about the Constitution. That's good. So... Negatives so far, he's a little stammering. Uh, okay, not great. Positives, strict strict constructionist. We're gonna strike down Roe v. Wade. Great, good to hear that. Really good to hear that. Although, keep that in your back pocket. Also, a strict constructionist when it comes to the Constitution of the Southern Baptist Convention, and really the responsibilities of the president, I think, can be grouped into three headings. It's the president's responsibility to protect the rights of the messenger body, to answer the questions of the messenger body and to execute the decisions of the messenger body. And um, I think a return to that, just a, a, a simple view of the SBC presidency that exalts the churches and the messenger body uh, is an accomplishment in and of itself. So again, that's good. The messenger body. Because ultimately, and I'll do another video uh, as the convention comes up. I really want to get to the convention. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. I don't. I, don't, I, I just don't know. I don't think so. Financially, I just don't think it's going to happen. More on that in a moment or another time. The convention, though, is not like any other denomination. It's bottom up. It really is. That's how it's structured. The the churches, the entities, all that do not have authority. The, the churches have authority toward the entities, toward the seminaries, toward Lifeway, toward ERLC, all that. The president works for them, not the other way around. Ed Litton, whoever gets elected here, cannot call my church and say, hey, you guys need to start teaching this. You need it. You need, why aren't you re using LifeWay resources? Why aren't you doing this? You really need to have women pastors. You really should have a woman preach on Mother's Day. You really should. We're doing this thing. You, we're doing a great commission offering and we're giving it all to Black Lives Matter. Whatever. No. no there's zero authority, literally zero authority for the higher ups in the SBC to go down to the local church. It's the other way around. So messengers, if you're a messenger, if you're in an SBC church, go to Anaheim. If you can get there, please, 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 please go. I want to go. Like I said, I don't think I can financially. Uh, I'm, I might make a video talking about that maybe next week, but it's far. I'm in Kentucky. Anyway, it's important, though, because the messengers, people, everyday people, whether it's a pastor, you don't just have to be a pastor, you know, elder or nothing. Men, women can go and represent and say, listen, I vote for this. I'm voting for these resolutions. I'm voting for this man for president, for first vice president, second vice president, and so on. And holding these people accountable. It's a big business meeting with food. And we're Baptists, right? Although all Christians like to eat. That's the joke. But point is that it's it's bottom up. So he says, you know, strict constructionist, this and this and this. Great. I'm glad to hear that. That really makes me happy. And uh, beyond that, uh, moderating the meeting fairly, I'm uh, prepared to do that, prepared to appoint yeah. committees. J.D. Greer last year did not moderate the meeting fairly at all. 
there were multiple times mics were turned off, multiple times people were not heard. Yeah, that's just... Now, again, if it, it, people could say that, right? Every politician and everybody else is saying these things, whether they're doing it is another story. That uh, are true to our common beliefs and the Baptist faith and message and supportive of the cooperative program and that help all of who we are as a family of Southern Baptists to be united of sharing the gospel all around the world. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. You gave me a couple more minutes. That's good. So uh, I'm Robin Hathaway, and it's good to be back in Texas again. I graduated from Southwestern. Actually, all three of us graduated from Southwestern Seminary. And um, I also attended Dallas Seminary for a couple of years before that. I met my wife, Kathy, who's here in the audience. Her sister is also here with her. And it was just a great thing that we were able to be married at First Baptist Dallas by W.A. Criswell. Backing up just a little bit, um, I was born in uh, Nashville, grew up uh, first grade in Biloxi, Mississippi. And then the rest of my time, uh, second grade through high school, I graduated from the Florida High School at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. My parents were not Christians. When I was 12 years old, we were going to the Christian Science Church, which is a cult. And uh, we had a, my parents had a Down syndrome child born. And uh, Christian Science says that that's an illusion. Well, they could tell it wasn't an illusion. And so the, their insurance agent, who was a member of First Baptist Tallahassee, witnessed to them. Great, great point. What did you say? I, I'm not from a, a Christian home. Parents were Christian science. They did end up becoming believers. But they said Down syndrome is just an illusion. And they're like, well, it's not an illusion. Right. So there's that theology matters, ladies and gentlemen. Theology matters a lot. And how things and how we perceive things, how we understand our world matters. He just said, well, that's a cult. That's good. Thank you for you know saying that. Hopefully we'll get to that about other things being a cult too. We'll see. Them. C.A. Roberts uh, led my parents to Christ. And I remember when my parents were baptized together. Talks about evangelism. So when I was 12 years old, we went from the Christian Science Church to Southern Baptist. And that's good. That's where I grew up. How or what can happen when someone is one to Christ? Yeah. I mean, proclaiming the gospel, living unto Christ, inviting people to church, questioning people's worldview, pushing against. That's what I'm doing on this channel. It's at least the goal. I mean, I probably don't always do it. Uh, but being against the world before the world, because somebody was against me, somebody was against you if you were a follower of Christ. I went on to University of Memphis, where I uh, graduated from, from there, and then went in the Air Force for four years. He talks about himself. And uh, we met uh, Stan White, who's the son of Kayla White, one of the early Mr. Sanders here. Uh, the Lord brought us home, where I became for a couple of missionary couples overseas. And that's what draws together once a year to pass the budget for the Home Mission Board and the International Mission Board. All these other things we do, including where I work at the seminary, are, are excellent. Thank you very much. 30 mute. All right. So Robin Hathaway, great guy. All three of these guys, I would love to have conversations with. I would love to just sit down and have at the church fellowship meal, have in my church. Uh, each of the guys just all seem to be great, wonderful Christian men. They really do. Um, all three of them. I did talk to Tom Askell on my channel. I've also talked to him, like I said, with Bobby Gilstrap. And so, I mean, I have my biases. You have your bias. We all do. I'm, I'm, I'm unbiased. Well, sorry. You're human. No one's unbiased. You can try and be as not partial, right? Not, not show partiality and judge based on content of character, not color of skin or other such things. But at the end of the day, we're all biased. We all have a preference. We all have a worldview. I like Tom Askell the best. Now, I'm trying to be fair. I'm trying to be fair. Um, yeah. So, but Robin Hathaway, hey, evangelism, great, missions, talking about all this, gives a lot. Of, but a lot of it's just kind of, hey, about me. Now, this is about me, right? This is the intro. So, it's good. I'm not ragging on him for that. But let's just see what Tom has to say. 30 from Bart, so I get six. Is that right? I'm not sure my math's right. Well, thank you so much for hosting this and for doing this. I'm delighted to be here. I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, and I was the youngest of six kids that were born to a very godly mother and a very uh, troubled father. My father was the son of a Muslim Syrian immigrant, and he grew up a really hard life. He saw his dad murdered at his side when he was 11 years old, and so that affected him for all of his life. And by God's grace, I believe my dad came to Christ before he died, and we were all delighted with that. All six of my, uh, all six of us kids did uh, come to know the Lord early. Uh, two of them are with the Lord now, and I came to know the Lord as a child. And again, uh, it's the power of a godly mother. There's, you look at our family. If you put it down on paper and you say this family is so dysfunctional, you cannot anticipate anything. Power of a godly mother, right? What does he say? Six kids. So mothers, legacy matters. Fathers, legacy matters. Your testimony matters. It really does. And I, I'm telling that to myself. Trust me. I really am. Because, you know, 
grit the teeth. The ch child's not listening. Oh, come on, just what are you doing? But it matters. It really does, folks. Evangelism matters. Maybe you're an unbeliever watching this, although the algorithm doesn't really seem to allow unbelievers and, and people who don't want to watch the video, watch the video, but share it with somebody. So please share this with somebody. Um, Christian life matters. It's not just about ethics. It's not just about listening to some old book or going to church or giving 10% of your income or something like that, but rather living the way God has designed us to live. Despite our sin, despite our brokenness, I mean, he says he saw his his dad, so his grandfather, Tom Askell's grandfather, was killed when Tom Askell's dad was 12 years old, 11 years old, however, whatever. I mean, that's just crazy. As an as a adolescent turning from child to adult, that whole transitional period, and your dad dies in front of you? Very troubled, he says, right? But he said, come, come to know the Lord later, praise God. But even if not, his whole life was still marked by his mom and the, the woman in his life preaching Christ, living Christ, being patient and kind. Of course, she probably got angry with them, the Askell family, right? They probably got upset. She probably got annoyed. She probably grit her teeth and, you know, threw her whatever. And, you know, we've all done that. But the, the point is living unto Christ and knowing that Jesus is better. Christ's way is better. The gospel is better. So I'm thankful for that. So again, he's telling his story. There's nothing wrong with that's the whole point. These are introductions. I'm good coming from this. And yet my mother prayed, and my earliest recollection of anything spiritual was seeing her on her knees in my living room as a little boy, and she was pleading with God, begging God. And I thought she really believes she's being heard by somebody. And the Lord used that and other things when I was eight years old to bring me to faith in Christ. When I was 16, he called me to the pastoral ministry, and I was very conflicted about that. I didn't want to be a pastor. I was very self-righteous in my own uh, I viewed myself in relationship with other people. But over a period of several months in council, uh, that began confirmed. The church asked me to preach. I was able to preach as a 16-year-old. My best friend was converted in that sermon, and God began to open up other doors for me to preach. I went to Texas A&M and studied sociology, still thinking maybe I didn't have to be a preacher. If I became a sociologist, God would be happy with that. You know. And uh, my senior year at A&M, a little church in, in College Station, Rock Prairie Baptist, asked me to come preach three Sundays in a row. And after that, they said, we want you to be our pastor. And that changed my plans completely. I'd already mapped out a, a career path at that point and uh, became pastor. And after graduating from a &M, I didn't have anything better to do, so I went to Southwestern Seminary and continued <laughs> my studies there. Uh, from there, my first year, uh, during that year, I was married to my wife, Donna, and uh, we've been married here in 42 years now. God's blessed us with six kids and 15 grandkids and one on the way. Uh, our oldest daughter is here in Texas serving the church in College Station. The other five are married. So notice again the legacy, right? So he comes from a family of six. They're in Texas. Tom's in, in Florida now. He's been there for several decades. He had six kids, or he's part of one of six, right? Troubled father, he says. Godly mother. He grows up, but all the kids are saved. Now they're all adults. Two are with the Lord. Tom Askell has, marries his wife, Donna. He has, what did he say, six kids? Five kids? Six kids? They are all believers, all serving, all near each other. So notice that legacy. If there was no godly mother, Mrs. Askell, Tom's mom, who knows, Right? There wouldn't be a founder's ministry. There wouldn't be a collection of people. There, would, You wouldn't hear Vody Bauckham sermons and Tom Nettle sermons and Mark Coppinger sermons. You wouldn't know. And if, if you don't know founder's ministry, go check it out. They are more reform Calvinistic. Uh, they're not like over the top. So if you're like afraid of that or something, that's fine. Uh, you can be afraid of it or, you know, disagree with it. Okay. But we can all learn. We need to build coalitions. Even if you're not a five-point Calvinist, four-point Calvinist, whatever. And I differ on some things and we all do. But we need to understand that the enemy hates Christians. If you love Christ, if you love his word, if you know it's sufficient and infallible and inerrant, then we can lock arms. Let's love each other. Yeah, I might differ on, you know, even creation, although that's my wheelhouse. End times. Eh, 4.5 point Calvinist. I'm not really sure about this whole Calvinist thing. I'm not really sure about Arminianism. I'm not really sure. We need to be unified in the gospel, unified in the sufficiency of the word of God. We really do. And trust, if you're in a church and you're like, ah, I don't know, I didn't want to find a different church. I don't know. I, my pastor's too this, he's too that, he doesn't preach this. He's... If he loves the Lord, if he's if he goes to the Bible, if he prays, if he's seeking to educate his children, his grandchildren, and supporting parents in that, lifting up Christ and making much of him, that is where you need to be. But the more subtle things is the seeker sensitive stuff, the seekery things that really, really infect the church. 
like a cancer. And truthfully, I think a lot of the critical race theory, intersectionality, all that wokeism in the last five to 10 years is the new seeker church movement that we saw from 25, 30 years ago crop up. But anyway, buried and in K Coral with us, they're faithful in the church. Uh, it's just again, it's a testimony of God's grace. You would never have predicted this. Yep, there you uh, go. Sixty-five exactly years. Ago. This is what God has done. <laughs> I've been pastor at Grace Baptist now for uh, thirty-six years. I'll be thirty-six years next month, and it's a, a wonderful story of God's kindness in leading me there. It's, it's the most vital uh, ministerial call that I have. I do other things. I write, teach, and lead some nonprofits, but nothing compares to being a pastor. I'm delighted to be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. I love the Southern Baptist Convention, but I'm concerned about the Southern Baptist Convention. I think we need to change the direction in the way that we're going. Not because we got ranked liberals among us. I don't believe that's true. But I believe that the winds of, of, of an acidic cultural mindset has begun to creep in to some of our institutions and agencies. And it's my firm conviction, as I said all the time, that the churches of the convention own the institutions and agencies. The institutions and agencies need to be responsive to the churches. And yet I don't think that's always happening the way that it should happen. And so my great desire is to see local churches become more involved in the convention. Okay, so again, Hathaway and Bart Barber, Robin Hathaway, Bart Barber, don't talk about the convention at all. Now, Tom doesn't come out. Now, he did do By What Standard um, two years ago, movie documentary about 2019 Resolutions Committee, Resolution 9 in particular. And it, it, everybody knows where he's at, or at least they should. He doesn't come out saying, ah, critical race theory is a cult, right? He could, probably should, maybe. Uh, he could have, but regardless, the point is that he doesn't do that. Hey, this is me. This is who I am. God's provision his kindness. I love the SBC, this and this and this folks though. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem and we need to fix this. There's an acidic worldview. Notice he said that there's something creeping in, right? The other two guys don't address that in their intro. And we're not going to watch the whole thing, like I said, although this video will probably go a little longer uh, just because I want to get a lot of their content in. But he's he's addressing, he's not slandering anybody. He's not wanting to pick fights. He's not angry at all. He doesn't sound upset even per se. He's very cool, calm, collected, rank liberals. I feel like there's probably some liberals um, because 40 years ago, we probably would have said the same thing. 41, 42 years ago, maybe 19. 79 is when Adrian Rogers, and then it was... Uh, into the 90s, where we saw Al Mohler at Southern, who actually was the moderate candidate, believe it or not. He wasn't the conservative candidate. He was a third option. Um, and he was elected, and he became more conservative. Now he's kind of waffled on a few things, and he's kind of backpedaled. And I have deep respect for Dr. Mohler. I really do. Um, anyway, but Paige Patterson was part of that. Mark Coppinger of Interviewed him on my channel, one of my favorite seminary professors, really solid guy. He actually works with founders there at Tom with Tom Askell. He was the president at Midwestern in the 90s as well. Uh, and a few other guys, also Gateway. They all, because there's six seminaries. Golden Gate, which is now Gateway, Midwestern, Nor New Orleans, Southeastern, Southwestern, and Southern. And uh, yeah. But in the last five to ten years, especially in the last, definitely the last five years, there's been an increase Places like Southern, places like Southeastern, even Southwestern, uh, those three kind of are starting to do some sketchy stuff or have been. Convention process. We have 47,000 churches in Southern Medicine Convention. 47,000, 45,000. Last year, we might have 50, 10,000 of those 51, churches. Volumes about the we don't rank and file Southern Baptists that are not involved. <laughs> I see they're not numbers. speaking. They need to, to show up, they need to stand up, they need to speak up. And we need to remind our institutions and agencies that, that we bought them, we paid for them, we pray for them, they're accountable to us. And I, I've raised questions with entity heads, with trustees for years about concerns, and I just haven't been satisfied uh, with the answers that have been given. Okay. So again, he's in this is the intro, right? This is the intro, but he's going in and saying, look, like I already said, I'm not gonna recap it. This, this, and this about me. However, SBC, we, we got some we got some troubles. There's some issues. We need to address these issues. But notice he's not angry, right? There is no air of like, oh, how dare you? And I'm really bitter and upset. None of that. I mean, he's a very, he's a very firm, convictional man. And he's coming out of the gate strong, very strong. If he didn't have my vote already, he would have my vote here. Because the other two guys seem like great guys. But we're not looking for just a great guy, a great neighbor, right? 
And people have asked me for years, why don't you run for president? You talk about these things and you, you raise concerns, but why don't you do something? And I always said, man, I'd rather be beaten with a bag of pennies than to do that. I've got a full plate. <laughs> you told me that. I don't too. have any other agenda, any other aspirations. But this year, that uh, effort to prevail upon me became stronger. Our leaders in the church agreed. My family agreed. Don agreed. We said, okay, we'll do this, see what the Lord does. I don't know if he'd have me be president or not, but if he does, I will uh, do my best. And my desire is to see the Southern Baptist Convention be as healthy as it can be for the wonderful mission that God has given us to accomplish together. All right. So. Those who are like, ah, forget it, stupid SBC, I'm done. They're woke. They're terrible. That's the sentiment of the modern moment. 45 years ago, had people had that view, we wouldn't be sitting here. And a lot less people would be saved. A lot less people, oh, God's sovereign. Yes, but he uses the means, right? He does. And depending on how meticulous you see, whether it's control or controlling or allowance or whatever you want to say with God's sovereignty, the point is we are here and we should be faithful. Okay. IMB and NAM are the two biggest missionary organizations, North American Mission Board, International Mission Board, six seminaries. We, in those seminaries, we educate a third of all seminary students, a third. So that matters. We can't lose the institution. Just like the PCUSA still exists. Now it's marching through in a much smaller way, but it used to be massive and it's hemorrhaging people. I've done videos on that. Oh, God of pronouns is that video. I believe it is. I looked at that. Uh, it's a woman praying uh, to the God of pronouns. It was a church up in Iowa. Anyway, that was about a month or so ago. Back in March. The SBC will still exist, even if all the conservative churches left. I know Josh Bice, Voice Bice, whatever it is, he left. And that's fine. Yeah, again, I'm not like angry at people or whatever. But but there's other churches that are convictional saying, no, we're staying in because of this. Join us. Now, there have been other people who have left because of Resolution 9 being challenged or presidents signing the document saying critical race theory and intersectionality. That was end of 2020. I believe it was end of 2020, maybe 2019, no, 2020, um, saying it's incompatible and everything else. People left because of that, wanting critical race theory to be accepted and it's seeing, it, oh, it's not being accepted. We're going to leave. So there's people on both sides. Oh, it's too rank. It's too liberal. It's too terrible. We're leaving. Other people, oh, no, we're, we're leaving because it's not enough. It's not, it's too conservative, quote, unquote. It's too white. It's too not diverse enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's silly. Point is, we got to fight. This is the time to fight. It really is. Don't be squishy. Don't be wishy-washy. Use the means that God has given you. Does that mean starting a channel? Does that mean starting a podcast? Does that mean tweeting about it? Does that mean going to the, asking your church if you're Southern Baptist? Go to the convention. Go to the convention and do it. You know, I think we found that among a lot of California churches in, in our Pioneer West that um, Pioneer West. see that our, our like churches it. are the best. Now, there's always issues. California pastor friend of mine said there's always foxes in the vineyards, these little things that, that crop up that you have to take care of. But that's just how it is in church life because of people's sin. But I believe that Southern Baptists are the ones that uh, really lead the charge for evangelism in church planning, uh, especially in our, in our state and, and out in the West. Yeah, well, I don't think the Southern Baptist Convention is the best organization for every church. I think there are a lot of churches that just couldn't handle being a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. We are diverse, and we, we have a unity that is based upon things that some churches think is not significant enough. And so, Okay, so real quick, Robin Hathaway. <clears throat> so he's a missionary pre professor, senior professor at Midwestern, been overseas for a long time. He's lived in California, so he's all over. Uh, different than the other two guys. That being said, Robin Hathaway, ah, there's, some, there's a few issues. Yeah, there's a few issues. Uh, but it's because of people's sin. Okay. And it is, right? It always is. But that's another indicator. That's another negative to say, I don't, do you really understand the issues though? Because I don't, I don't, I don't think with that attitude, you understand really what's going on or you're willing, willingly ignorant. Because even with the passage of Resolution 9, that still stands, although it's not binding on any local church. So it's kind of weird. It's like it has power, but it doesn't. Still, still is something that exists and it's there and people fought over it. And Nashville was not some kumbaya session. There was several instances, especially with abortion, that was like, I, wait, what? What are we doing? Why are we, why did you guys just cheer? I thought we were, and you know, we were in the 
far in the back and it was kind of hard to hear sometimes and really know what's going on because it's, you know, several thousand people in there, a big convention center. But regardless, there were some times where my wife and I uh, and, and the other messengers that were with us were like, wait, wait, I'm sorry, what did we just miss? Like, what was, I thought, what are we doing? What's going on? Like, anyway, so th there is division. There is, there are, you know, I'll push back on Tom. I think there are rank liberals among us. I think there's people that aren't holdovers necessarily from 40 years ago, 30 years ago who left and uh, built the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, CBF. That's a very leftist, liberal organization, women pastors, theological liberalism all over the place. It's not that type of liberalism. I think it's in one sense worse because they say, oh, yeah, I believe the Bible. I think the Bible is inerrant. I think the Bible is infallible. And you're kind of like, uh-huh. And they're like, well, I mean, I didn't say anything about sufficiency, though. You're like, but it needs to be sufficient also. <laughs> Everything pertaining to life and godliness, doesn't it have? Uh, or, uh, uh, maybe. Does it or not? Churches have left the convention. I've talked to some of their pastors, you know, and that's a, that's a decision between them and God. I grieve over that whenever I, I know the people, but I understand that there's different talking about Josh Weiss. the SBC in a way sure. that if you're not content to live with Pastor diversity Jordan. within the boundaries that we've agreed upon, oh, then you're not going to be happy too. here. But I, I am delighted to be a part of a church that I, I led into our association when I went there. They were Southern Baptists on the state level, but not locally, because I believe that the Southern Baptist Convention matters. We are the largest mission sending agency in the world. We educate one out of every three seminary students in the United States. Uh, we have opportunities to do things that uh, other organizations, religious organizations or conventions or associations or nominations don't have opportunity to do. We're the largest Protestant denomination in North America. So it matters. It matters not just within the SBC. It matters beyond the SBC. A rising tide lifts all ships. And if the SBC gets healthier, it will be better for the evangelical witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just in North America, but around the world. And again, like these brothers, you know, I've been at places around the world. I've seen the impact that Southern Baptist Missions has had. I've seen the impact that American Christianity has had, both good and ill. Okay. So what's he talking about there? Right. Again, Tom is being more, again, in my estimation, I've watched this whole thing. Strike that. I think I watched most of it. I didn't watch all of it. I don't want to lie to you. But he's being real, right? He's being real. And that's how I, and that's what I try and do with my pastor, my church, uh, online, here, uh, through Twitter, through Gab. You can follow, follow me. Uh, it's in the description if you're curious about following me on Twitter and, and uh, Gab and whatnot. But we, we serve a God of reality. This isn't a pie in the sky. Oh, just, oh, please, God of pronouns. Oh, please, God of my imagination. Oh, flying spaghetti monster. No, that's nonsense. That's stupid. It doesn't exist. We know there's a creation. We know there's a creator. Everybody knows that. Everybody. I don't care if you say you don't. You're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And I'm going to go with God and not you. Okay? Because men are liars and men are deceivers. <laughs> And you have every reason to try and deceive me, even though I already know the truth, because God has spoken it. But Tom is speaking the truth. Listen, SPC is great. But it's not for everybody. I know people laugh. And, okay, I grieve that. But at the end of the day, this is the biggest missionary organization. This is the biggest sending organization. This matters. And he's good and ill, right? So he doesn't just say, oh, we're the best. Now, I understand the other guys, we want to, oh, we're the best, right? Just like, you know, the Dems and the GOP, oh, we're the best, we're this, oh. Now, he's not, they're not attacking each other, thankfully, um, which is good. You know, that's different than politicians would, uh, you know, regular political people, men and women. But are we the best, though? And could we be better? Yeah. Are we the best now? Are we top notch now? No, no, we're definitely not now, no. We export There's problems. to the rest of the world what we do here. And if we're not doing it well here, it's not going to go well for the rest of the world. God's That's right. God's positioned us that way. That's right. So my desire would be to see the Southern Baptist Convention become healthier, to back up and evaluate who we are, who we say we are, and what we are really committed to being. And there's a lot of issues that we just, we need to face. They're not going away. And if we just pretend that everything's okay and let's just keep moving forward the way we've been doing things, it's not going to go well for us from my vantage point. So I'm grateful. It's not going to go well for us, right? We can't just keep doing the same old thing about the same old thing about the same old thing. It ain't going to go well. I'm in Kentucky. I can say ain't. It ain't going to go well. <laughs> like, it's not. And again, the other two guys, they don't really touch on this. They just don't. 
Why? I don't know. Willingly ignorant? I don't think they're stupid because they, as far as I know, they all have not just MDivs, masters, but also other doctorates and things like that. I think so. I, I haven't checked that, honestly. But it's probably just a, well, let's get along to go along, go along to get along. Just, yep. Yeah, just, just good old boys. And it's like, is it though? Because how did that work? Right. The fox is in the vineyard, even if Robin Hathaway is correct. And oh, they kind of sneak in and, you know, and using Tom's language of the acidic. No, I, I prefer the acidic language, although fox is in the vineyard, of course, is a biblical phrase. But leaven of the Pharisees, that's a biblical phrase, too, which is probably what Tom's getting at. I would say don't want to put words in his mouth. But what is going on? There's people coming in, bringing in ideologies, and they're going to talk about critical race theory. We'll probably just finish with that. So let's get there. To be a Southern Baptist, I praise God for all the good that he's done in our history. Not been perfect, made a lot of mistakes, have to repent. We will have to repent in the future. But praise God for how he has marshaled together these kinds of resources, this kind of unity on the so that we can, as Baptists, with our distinctive commitments, seek to make the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ known, not just here, but throughout the world. I tell you, I'm really thankful for the Southern Baptist Convention, not only because of what's personally happened in my life about the way that Southern Baptist churches and institutions have loved me, educated me, given me opportunities to serve, but also because of the way that we have been able to move forward. Uh, some, some of the people I've talked to who say, I'm not sure I want to be Southern Baptist anymore. They'll talk about all the things that we fight about. We're fighting all the time, but today we're fighting about different things than we were fighting about three or four years ago. And we realign every few years as a new issue comes up and people get into what sometimes look like strange bedfellows based on what, where things were not long ago. And that's because our process works for us to talk about questions and issues and to resolve those issues. Okay, so the process on paper works, right? And it has worked in the past, but at the convention last year, there were plenty of people who were having their mics turned off, not wanting to address questions. There were votes that, because we vote, we raised a little thing, not for president, but for resolutions. And there were a few times where it was like, and it passes and we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 <laughs> Like, Because it's literally just a quick you know, hold the thing up and they look at the sea of people like, oh, is there more than 50% less of, you know, whatever. There was a few times where I was like, I don't know, not from this vantage point. Now they're up on the platform and we'll look at an article here in a moment with that, what the platform is. It's from uh, Servants and Heralds. And I might do another video specifically on that, but we'll touch on it briefly. I think I will probably next week. Um, just looking at that a little bit more closely. It's not functioning well, right? Start the SBC, anything you start off, a business, a school, whatever. This is the mission, this is what we're going to do. Like, just like a brand new car. right? But even if you have the brand new car, sit for 10, 12, 15, 20 years, it's going to get dirty, it's going to get rusty. Even if you just have it sit there and not even drive, the oil in there, all the fluids, all the liquids, they're all going to dry up. The engine's going to freeze. All these things, bad, bad, bad. you got to put energy. It's entropy. That's what it is. Second law of thermodynamics, everything wears down. This is one of the main reasons why materialistic evolution doesn't work. You have to have constant uh, care and design and, and intentionality put into the world. It breaks down otherwise. Bart Barber, I think, is being a little naive here. That's just me. And move forward. And I'm thankful for the way that... that I think that's because Baptists are right. <laughs> because Baptists yeah, has yeah. been doing I think we're right too. coalitions, not for churches in our new... Let's get up to 26. Animal. And so it's, it's very hard to, to uh, go in and, and to, to see what all they believe. I served, I, I think there's a question on the uh, committee, credentials committee, but I served on the 2000 credentials committee. And all we're looking for there is simply that we would uh, be, be able to... Um, Tell should they sit at that convention? But the other criteria, and I see I'm out of time, but I already gave you 30 seconds back, so I'll take that one back. Um, so, so I, I, would, I would just say that um, it, it's it's the situation where the credentials committee is just that convention. Further credentials committee deliberation. That's another story. Let's get over to Tom here. And so my church isn't going to do anything the same way the Barst Church is going to do it. And that's okay. He's in Texas. I'm in Florida. We should acknowledge that. But we do need to come to terms with some of the problems that we are facing now. This was a philosophy of ministry question. And Tom's like, well, philosophy is the handmaiden of theology, which it is. Or because of philosophies that have come in from the world, which the Apostle Paul warns us against in Colossians 2, 8 and 9. And look at how those philosophies have begun to erode the foundation of our cooperative unity. And I'm deeply concerned about that. So now we have churches that say that it's their ministry philosophy to ordain women. It's their ministry philosophy to affirm uh, organizations that uh, say that they are caring for homosexual Christians and that that's a good way to live. Not right. I don't think our tent is that big. If it's that big, then we've got problems. We need to look at the stakes and go back and say, no, here are our boundaries. 
Oh, yeah, we believe ordaining women. Well, I don't care what you believe. Ultimately, I want to see what the scripture says. And the scripture, and then coupled with history and historical evidence, both in the first century and all the way through to the 21st century, is evident. Women aren't pastors. Women aren't elders. Women aren't to exercise authority over men, preaching and teaching and so on. It's pretty straightforward. It's very cut and dry. We don't like that because the church is all basically second wave feminist. The world is on their way to being fourth wave feminist, meaning, you know, women aren't anything at all. Men can be women and, you know, women can excel at being, uh, or men can excel at being women. I mean, we see this with Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce, and we see this with, I don't even know the, what's his face, Levine, um, person, guy, man. And like, <laughs> first year, second year being a woman and, and, and you get woman of the year, like, uh, it's really just, that's all it takes. Just, just grow your hair out and change your name. That's it, right? That's all it means to be a woman? Hardly. He cites uh, Colossians 2. Very good. There's not a lot of scripture cited from the other guys, at least in the parts that I watched. The I watched about an hour, maybe it was like 45 minutes, something like that, 50 minutes. So I didn't get to watch the whole thing. But I wanted to make this video because it's fresh on my mind. And uh, yeah, the great news is you. we have a statement of faith that already addresses those issues. We have parameters of fellowship within the Southern Baptist Convention. Not only do we have parameters of fellowship in the Baptist faith and message, but we also have a way that we set those parameters. And it's that the messenger body of the votes to decide what the parameters of fellowship are within the Southern Baptist Convention. And I think we've done a good job. So, so really, all these churches, they're not accountable to just my opinion or the opinion of me and a few friends. They're accountable to what the messenger body has voted with. Somebody's yep, persuaded the messenger that's body a good to word. adopt as parameters of fellowship within our convention, I think we've done a good job of differentiating between preferences and doctrine. And I think it's important that we keep that. See, again, I think that's a naive statement. Now, I think some people, yes, and obviously we're talking about tens of thousands of churches, but there are some. Rick Warren's church is now SBC. They've been SBC for a few years. They just ordained women like a year or two ago as pastors. Well, is anybody going to do anything about that? Well, it's Rick Warren, though. He's got the purpose-driven lie. I, li <laughs> life. <clears throat> Life, right? Purpose-driven life, not lie. There's an extra F in there. <laughs> like, are we going to do anything? Like, women aren't pastors, man. It's really not that hard. It really isn't that difficult. And it's nothing against women. Just as God has ordained men to preach, he's ordained women to have babies. We don't mix that, right? And what is the world doing? Where are we getting this? We're not getting this from the scripture. Right. And that's always been my thing. That's my biggest uh, affront against materialistic evolution. You don't get that from the scripture. You get it from the world and it comes in. And the world always is dogging the church because, well, Satan is the prince of this world. Yes, God is king. Yes. But there's. Uh, that's another video. That level of differentiation in mind when we make those decisions. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the second question we have for you today um, has to do with critical race theory, CRT. Um, and so we look out into the culture and we see uh, school boards and churches and organizations and businesses uh, dealing with uh, talking about this issue. It's on the news. So what is CRT? Is it manifesting in churches or organizations, including the SBC? Okay, this is 30 minutes. We're going to watch this last section, uh, comment on it <clears throat> and wrap up. I know it's a longer video, but I, I wanted to get this in one fell swoop because I think Y'all just prefer that more. So, and if any, uh, what if anything should the SBC and its president do about it? Pay so close. all you have to know about CRT to be ready to walk away from it is that uh, it proposes some ideas of what justice is that are at odds with the Judeo-Christian idea. Okay, walk away from it. So he's already saying, "Hey, just like the Roe v. Wade, that's good, right?" He kind of hints at that. That's good, great. We're striking that down. Walking away from CRT, you know, all you really need to know to walk away from it because it's not that really big of a deal. That's kind of the air. Maybe he's. Maybe that's not what he means, but that's kind of what I'm getting at. Just kind of this middle road. Yeah, that's probably not the best idea. We probably shouldn't do that. He's not talking about analytical tool. That's good. But he's also not talking about it like an acidic, corrosive element either. Of justice that's passed down into American jurisprudence. Um, I think it's important to ask what is CRT, uh, not only for yourself, but also for the other people you're talking with about it. Uh, I'm interested in truth, and I conducted a poll Good. to try Me to figure too. out whether we were actually talking past each other. 1,500 people responded to my poll. Only 63 out of 1,500 said that they affirmed critical race theory. 
half of those were people who were not Southern Baptists. So you had uh, fewer than fewer than 40 uh, who were um, who were Southern Baptists who said they affirmed critical race theory. And of those people, only four agreed with the statement that said white people are racist just by virtue of being white. Okay, only four out of 1,500. But I've had people tell me that that was what critical race theory was. It was the idea that white people are guilty just by virtue of being white. Okay, I, I'm going to probably pause this a little more. So four people out of 1,500 say that white people are racist for being white out of the people that responded to his poll. Now that's a decent sized sample, right? It's not obviously as big as it could be, but it's bigger than, you know, asking just your friends. So that's fine. Where he conducted this. I don't know how he conducted it. I don't know, but yes, part of part of the thing, just the pie, right? A slice of that wicked satanic pie. That is CRT. A slice of that is white people are racist because of the color of their skin, which is insane and a racist statement all by itself, or really partiality, right? Let's go with biblical terms. It's partiality. Hatred for another person, showing partiality, showing favoritism, yet God shows no favoritism, right? But was it, well, only four of them said that. So he kind of has this air like, well, you know, there's some people, there's some kind of wackos, kind of people who just don't really get it. But they're not really a threat. Well, I would believe that if we didn't have Resolution 9, who was shoved through with several other resolutions to save time as they were burning up time in 2019's convention in Birmingham, Alabama, and shoving it through. Oh, we're just going to package this together because they ultimately knew that it wasn't going to pass. But it ended up passing just barely, even though Tom Askell was actually one of the people who stood up against it and had them revote and do this other stuff. They're, they're the platform and... I'll touch on it briefly. The platform, in fact, let's just look at it real briefly here. This is uh, Servants and Heralds, and this talks about the platform. I'll put this in the description, and we'll look at it in another video. But I'm talking what we call the platform. So this is basically Big Eva uh, or, or the establishment, the elites, whatever you want to call it. Remember 2018, that was right before 2019 with... Resolution 9. Talks about the plagiarism. Talks about J.D. Greer, Ed Litton. I mean, Ed Litton was basically kind of just a, a clone of J.D. Greer in many respects. Very thankful, again, that he's not rerunning. That's why we have presidential candidates, again, because normally it's just kind of a second-year customary thing that the president gets elected in the second year. There really aren't contenders. Honestly, he probably would have lost, though. There would have been somebody, maybe a Tom Askell, who would have challenged him, and he would have lost. And it would have been more humiliating for himself. And he's already put himself through enough silliness uh the platform pushes around you definitely know or uh president and national 2021 everything was controlled by the stage like james Merritt, the resolutions committee chairman wagging his finger at wagging his finger the platform doesn't think that every day sbc church really knows what's best for the convention and that was the thing uh and yeah we'll we'll pause it there i think and look more closely at this article uh for another video next week but the platform is what he's talking about. And there were several things at Nashville, in Nashville, <clears throat> that I was like, wait, what? This this top-down hierarchical structure, which I think has, has really corrupted a lot of denominations and many other things as well. Whereas SBC, the Baptists, aren't that. And yet James Merritt, who was on the Resolutions Committee, um, who's a big-time name, and has disgraced himself a lot through supporting his homosexual son and other things. Uh, I mean, the world was watching, saying this and that. I mean, you're just like, guys, like, what are you doing? What about God? Is God watching? What about us? What about the messengers? Let us speak. And it's clear evidence. When I was there in person, clear evidence that that was happening even more so than what we see from articles and videos and things like that. So the platform, the elites, the big Eva people want things. They don't want Tom Askell, by the way. The platform does not want Tom Askell because he pushes the envelope. He pushes against things too much. So let's go back to the video. I'll do a vid uh, I'll do another video just on that article. Um, Servants and Heralds, look for that. Any clarification that I drive you or Tony, do you want from Bart? Anybody? 
Yeah, Bart, do you think that uh, it's possible that those folks that are saying, no, we don't believe in critical race theory, really don't think they are, but could have well imbibed the ideas of critical race theory as just being a part of this culture where it is so preeminent? I think the only way we're going to know that for sure is if we can agree on the definition. I appreciated uh, what you said in your interview. Uh, well, okay, so funny, though. So how does he have agree on the definition? Well, what was his definition? Or did he have a definition in his poll? Right. Did Bart Barber say critical race theory is <coughs> blank, 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 blank. Or not. Or did he just say what's CRT? I mean, James Merritt from the platform. I don't know if you guys saw this. Uh, or not those maybe who were there or or watch videos later, but he's like, I see critical race, I see CRT. The only CRT in the Bible is Christ returns triumphantly, and I, I mean, I was just like, oh, just a groaning eye roll. Like, are you kidding me? Like, come on, man, don't don't do that. Don't pander to us. Yes, Christ returns triumphantly, but that's not what critical race theory means. That's not what CRT is. That's not what CRT means, right? Like, that's 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 just. You're pandering to this middle ground. Okay, everybody, kumaya, just get along. Jesus is coming back. How are we going to labor? How are we going to work together if we have this acidic, corrosive element coming in at the right core foundation? If we're now taking worldviews and our worldview is different and being swapped out or corroded so much that this goo that is critical race theory seeps in and then now is this jelly that your house is sitting on. How is that going to work, ladies and gentlemen? It's not. Is there a definition? Why didn't he give a definition to begin with? I don't know. And he doesn't really give a definition now. Well, if we can agree to the definition, well, can we? Well, let's try and define it. I'm supposed to press my remarks. I'm not right. I, I, I insisted on that and I've already broken it. Sorry about that. Um, I, uh, I nice guy. Tom had to say right? two days ago in his interview where he said, you know, we may find out that our differences are not nearly as great maybe. as we think maybe they are. Um, I, I think they possible. are, though. Uh, why don't we find that out before we get into a big uh, uh, argument with each other? I think we ought to talk. Okay, so again, you can tell, hey, uh, I don't really want a big, a big, a big argument. Uh, no, let's argue. What if, what if Paul didn't stand against Peter when he excused himself when the, uh, the um, Judaizers came, right? Slandering those then, showing partiality, Right? Paul and Barnabas go one way. Uh, uh, John Mark and I forget who. It's in Acts. Paul didn't want Mark or John Mark, who wrote, ended up writing the gospel of Mark. Paul was wrong there. Peter was wrong. Paul was wrong. People are going to be wrong. Let's be brothers and sisters in Christ, challenge each other. Look, I'm arguing with you, but I'm arguing about the facts. I'm arguing about life. I'm arguing about the word of God. We're not just talking about like, hey, listen, I really don't like that you guys have carpet. I really don't like that you guys have pews. I don't really like that you guys have a big pulpit or I don't like you don't have you don't have a pulpit. I don't like that your you know, pastor wears skinny jeans and, you know, cool guy T-shirts. I don't like that. And we're, oh, you're dumb. I hate you. You're blah, blah, blah. You're like the world. You're a bigot. You're hateful. You're whatever. You're insane. You're No, we're not doing any of that. What we're doing is we're fighting about things arguing about good things the right things and barbara's like oh you know I, I, we just don't really hey let's find out before we argue about it let's argue about it yeah what what's wrong with that though i mean again if the argument is whether or not to like heal a patient with you know actual healing medicine or you know telling them to go eat jello four times a week and hope for the best like no, no, the jello isn't going to do anything for your cancer. Probably make it worse, <laughs> right? Like, I feel like it's just these kind of obfuscation sort of thing, these these shifting, ah, let's just not really talk about it. Talk to each other in such a way that um, we're only ready to start debating something when we can say what the other person's viewpoint is so well that they say, yes, that's exactly what I believe. Then we're ready to have those conversations. So it's best, I think, to talk about the issues, issue by issue, instead of just throwing <laughs> the, the That's best not really a good answer. Fair enough. Tom, uh, so the question goes to you. Yeah, well, critical race theory uh, is an offshoot of neo-Marxism, post-modernism, post and good. a theory that came out of critical legal theory. And it basically says that all racial relationships should be viewed in terms of power dynamics, and that some are inevitably oppressed and others are inevitably the oppressors. Now, it's worked its way out in a variety of uh, 
places and ways, like in Robin D'Angelo's book that says that you know, whiteness is just an ideology that everybody in this culture, this nation is born with, and that this nation is inherently and will forever be racist. And so it takes the idea of sinful partiality from the Bible and redefines it in ways that are completely unbiblical. And that's one of my great concerns about this, is what, this wouldn't even been a conversation among us had the resolutions committee in 2019 rewritten a resolution that was submitted to renounce critical race theory and intersectionality. They rewrote it to affirm critical race theory and, inter and, and intersectionality. And then we were told, no, they're just good analytical tools. And I, that was a disaster for the SBC. It was tragic that it happened. Our six seminary presidents have now said critical race theory is incompatible with the Baptist faith and message. But one of those presidents the next day said, well, I wish we hadn't said it exactly that way. And when they said it, there were churches that left the convention over it. But okay, so did you guys get that? So 2019, right? June 2019, Resolution 9. And again, this is a watershed moment. It really is. And that's where, like, all right, this is the call to fight. That was only three years ago, people. Uh, we're done. We're there woke. No, no, stop. This is the 10 years from now, fine. Even five years from now, and it looks exactly the same or worse, great. Abandon ship. But right now, no. I was that way. I felt that way last year after Nashville. I was beleaguered and stressed out and frustrated. I'm not. And even if even if Ed Litton plagiarized and did all this stuff and he was still rerunning right now, there's this is still time to fight. There's still stuff to do. Don't get so discouraged. Don't have such a defeatist mentality. Please, 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 please. This is the time to fight. It really is. Even if you're not in the SBC, well, it doesn't matter. The SBC is the biggest denomination. It has the most influence. It has the most presence. It has the most missionaries internationally and nationally church planting, all the rest, all the seminaries, all the colleges. There's even more. There's a college at each seminary and then some, like Tennessee. I was just down there. Uh, it's in Jackson, Tennessee, Union University. I've heard it. Great school. It's an SBC school. There's no seminary there. It's just an SBC undergraduate school. There's plenty. There's some in Georgia and Florida and Texas and all sorts of other places. So there's many more colleges that are all affected if the SBC just goes full on woke then what do we have left? We have all these institutions that are still there, all these schools that are still there, and they're just replacing the conservatives, the people, I love Jesus, I love the Bible, it's the word of God, uh, I love Christ and his church with people who are saying, well, you know, you know the patriarchy, you know, intersectionality is really, really actually how we should identify and use and filter through the Bible. We know that Genesis is really just myth. We know that, you know, David was just an adulterer and he was just a pagan, this and that. We know all these ideologies are just, you know, much more helpful than, than they're not. I mean, we can look at these things now. These are just ancient people. I mean, Jesus really wasn't God. I mean, we can see that, you know, there, obviously it's no way that a woman can be conceiving a baby after in wedlock and this, and you can understand that the cross was really just child abuse, cosmic child abuse. Right? Like, that is what would happen. And that has happened in the SBC 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And they turned the ship around. Now the ship is kind of going in the opposite direction toward back a different glacier ready to smash into it. But we can still turn the tide. We can still turn the ship. Let's finish with Tom and we'll call it a day. But to suggest this isn't a problem, I think, is, is not looking at all the evidence that is out there staring us in the face. Yeah. I do believe that this is an ideology that, as we're seeing in our newspapers and news reports and school board meetings and classrooms, it is part of our cultural air right now. And I do think that it's come in. We have one of our professors that gave an interview to the New York Times and says that he teaches. James Here we go. Here we go. So he calls out several professors, not by name, but anybody with their finger on the pulse knows who he's talking about. And that's good. And this is, again, this is good. He's doing it lovingly. He's doing it clearly. He's not being rude. This whole 11th commandment, that's nonsense. We need to quit it. Now is the time for arms. Now is the time for war. We need to pick up. We need to fight. We need to say, come on. There's an ideology. Let's fight. Oh, you're for the ideology? Well, let me go ahead and put you in prison, political prison, or, or you know, Get rid of you, obviously, theologically speaking, not physically. I'm not talking about physical violence. Hear me closely. I'm not talking about physical violence. I'm talking about ra knowledge raised up against Christ. And pull up Colossians 2. And uh, yeah, look at that. Oops, that's not what I wanted. There we go. 
Let's finish with Tom. James Cone, who's the father of liberation theology, very much influenced by this old ideology. Ideology said, I just don't use his name when I do it. Professor so at Southeastern Seminary, who wrote an article talking about how he was an oppressed man because he's black. And our seminary's got a PhD from Southern, Southern. Seminary, teaches at Southern Seminary, one of the most prestigious seminaries in the world. We got another professor who has um, endorsed the Revoice Conference, which says we affirm <coughs> gay Christianity. So the first guy was Walter Strickland. I'll name him <laughs> because I ain't got no problem with that. Walter Strickland at Southeastern. Jarvis Williams is a Southern. I don't know the third guy, though. I, I could look. I'm not going to. We want to help homosexual Christians to flourish. Brothers, these things shouldn't be. We have boundaries. And the Baptist faith and message certainly points out our doctrinal boundaries. But I do believe, just like we saw in the conservative resurgence, there are a lot of people who are saying, oh, we believe the Bible, we believe the Bible. But they're not thinking as rigorously as they need to be thinking about exactly what does the Bible say. And so that's part of my concern in this. I, I'm grieved over what I see happening. I don't, it's not a matter of a partisanship with me. It's a matter of deep conviction that we must change the direction of our convention right now. I, I think for the examples that you've listed of people who have said things that are objectionable, haven't all of those people come back and said, hey, that's not really accurately representing what I think and what I believe. And what are we supposed to do when people say, just like here, we're getting an opportunity to clarify. Right. Things. That's two questions. Let's listen closely. Two questions. We say, right. what, what are we supposed to do when other people ask for that? Right. Yeah, well, and I would be delighted for that, but the clarifications have not clarified. The clarifications in my mind have said things like, oh, this is not really, you know, what I meant, but they've not just gone back and said, no, I no longer endorse revoice. How hard is that to say? That's not hard to say. If you've endorsed a conference that affirms homosexual Christianity, how hard is it to say, I no longer endorse that? Or if you say, I talk, I teach James Cone, but I just don't use his name. How hard is it to say, I don't do that anymore. I used to do it. And I'm not going to do it anymore. Or if you say, I'm an oppressed person because of the color of my skin in the most prestigious seminary in the world. How hard is it to say, you know what? I'm, I'm, that's wrong. I shouldn't say that. That's the problem, is there's an obfuscation that seems to permeate the way that we talk about some of these things. And I just think we ought to be plain spoken. I mean, let's let our yes be yes and our no be no. I think we can do that as brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up there. That's at minute 40. I'm going to put it, the link in the description. Minute 40. So, again, Tom says, listen, there's these guys, these three guys. If it was one guy, it'd be one thing. But it's not just the three guys. It's actually probably dozens. Because even the class I had, you wouldn't know his name. Uh, but it was one of the last classes I had was the first time I really touched. And there was there was Jarvis Williams, who's on campus, who's ra ra written um, The Stain of Racism and a few other things. And again, racism. Yes, I understand that. But that's not what we're talking about now. And how we remedy it is not how they want to remedy it. OK, I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. I'm not saying racism didn't exist. But ultimately, it's partiality. If we're going to be Christians, we need to use the word because the Bible doesn't talk about racism at all. It talks about partiality. It talks about showing partiality, showing favoritism. Okay. Chattel slavery. Yeah, that's bad. Oh, bad, bad, bad. Okay, great. But we're not under that system anymore. Stop condemning things that we all know is bad. Stop it. We're done. Okay, great. We're going to condemn stuff right now. Like, I don't know, the murder of the unborn or people swapping genders or mutilating their flesh. Like prophets of Baal asking their modern 21st century Baal God to come down and dwell with them, but he's really relieving himself in the toilet or taking a nap. He's on vacation. See first Kings for Elijah. If you want more of that, what are we doing? Right. And this, again, I want to be real here. Tom Askell's the only man ready for this. Who would you have instead? Vody Bakum. Yeah, he'd be nice, but he's in a local church in Zambia. You, he's disqualified. You have to be in a local church in America to be president of the SBC. He can be the president of the pastor's conference, which is kind of just like a title. It's not really anything. Point is, Tom Askell is the only one who's talking about the issues. He really is. And these things shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. And Bar Barber said, well, shouldn't, didn't they re-clarify those things? They didn't, though. Didn't they backpedal? No. Not to my knowledge. As Jarvis Williams said, you know what? That was kind of, that was, that was wrong. That was kind of dumb. I shouldn't have said that. No, he still talks about that. He's, I've heard him found from his mouth identify as, you know, white, black, and, and uh, Native American. And his wife's Hispanic, I think maybe from Puerto Rico. Gives his experience. And that's great. Praise God. And I've heard him tell a story about his aunt and how she was dying and this and that. And, and how she came to Christ. And very touching stories. I've heard Jarvis William preach. I never took him in class. He seems like a very nice guy. I've, I've seen him around town. Great. Probably loves his wife and his children. Praise God. Faithful to his church. Okay. 
But what you're doing is you're swapping these things, these ideologies that shouldn't be. It has nothing to do with how much melanin I have in my skin or how much you have, how much hair you have, what eye color you have, how fat or skinny, muscular or athletic or lazy, whatever you want to call it, body types. None of that matters. None of it matters in our interpretation of scripture. Absolutely none of it. None of it. Okay. What does the text say? Colossians. My favorite ES vegan, as one of my professors in seminary called it. He, he loved ESV, but he called it ES vegan. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and those at Laodicea and those who have not seen me face to face. So notice there's struggle. There's real struggle. Paul is dealing with struggle nearly 2,000 years ago. Huh. Interesting. As if people are still the same nearly 2,000 years later. Yep. Newsflash. We are. That their hearts may be encouraged and knit together in love to reach all the riches and fullness assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. God's mystery. God's mystery is what? It's Christ. Oh, cool. Interesting. Because that's pretty mysterious, right? God becoming a man, dwelling among us, living a perfect life, dying and resurrecting, and ultimately finishing after 40 year, 40 days of ministry and ascending, being complete. And anybody who trusts him, trusts that work, is saved, is washed, is clean. And you can have that assurance now. And we know that from the text of Scripture, not because we're worshiping the text of Scripture, but because the author of the Scripture is trustworthy. Not because we get some inner feeling or, you know, acidic heartburn and we have a burning in the bosom or we just feel the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. No, we see it from the text, just like we can read the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, a history book a letter from your wife, a letter from your great-grandpa. All these things we can understand because of the author behind it. But too many people want to ridicule the Bible, mock the Bible. Well, it's not sufficient. It's not an error. We don't need it. At some point, I'm going to do a review of this channel that calls the Bible the mark of the beast. It's so, it's, it's just like, and of course they claim to be Christians, which is even more hilarious, but... <clears throat> In whom are all hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is Christ. Jesus is our example. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Lord. Are we going to worship him or not? I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness in the faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ the Lord, so walk in him. Church, family, even non-believers watching. Walking in Christ, that's the Christian life. Not just going to church, not just being baptized, not just whatever. Walking in Christ. Walking in Christ. Okay? Being rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving. What What is worse? What's worse? Or what makes it worse? Is having ungrateful hearts, right? Ungrateful hearts, unthankful hearts. These things ought not be, Paul says. They ought not be. What are you talking about? Built up and established in the faith that is taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Not just being thankful, but abounding in it. Just excelling still more in that thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, <clears throat> not according to Christ. For in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of rule and authority, in whom, in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Oh, I can keep reading. It's just so good. In him. Paul warned, don't be captivated by philosophy. Why? Just because it's an empty threat? It's an empty warning. No, because you can be captivated by ph philosophy. And not just philosophy, like a uh, boogeyman philosophy. No. Phylos there, it's love. And then uh, it, it means love of love of knowledge. That's what it means. We should have good philosophy, right? Having a Christian philosopher, having philosophy, reading even, you know, the greats of yesteryear, 
who aren't Christian, you can still glean from them, but you have to have a Christian worldview, a biblical understanding of reality, not a materialistic worldview. That's not going to get you anywhere. But, you know, spinning in painful circles, rooted and built up in him. See to it. Again, no one takes you captive by philosophy. An empty deceit, according to what? Human tradition. That's what intersectionality, critical race theory, all the wokeism, that's what that is. It's not an analytical tool. It's not compatible with scripture at all. More people believe it in that 1,500 person study that Bart Barber did, certainly, than admit. Or they even know. Like Tom says, Askel, it's the air we're breathing. Right? Just like years ago, People are against same-sex marriage, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, this president, can't, presidential candidate's evolving. I mean, Obama was against it. Then he was he was for it. Then he was against it. Then he's for it. But we have a word. There's a book. And the book says this. We believe the book. We're on the same page. But we don't just believe it, just like your children who hear you, even if they're 20 years old, and they don't act on that knowledge, right? Knowledge without action is nothing. It's meaningless, right? Hey, there's careful. There's a cliff up ahead. You'll just go right off. If you go, if you're going in the speed limit at all, you got to go like half the speed limit. Don't go 50, 60 miles an hour. You got to go like 25 around this cliff or you just go straight off. Okay, cool. Good to know. And you're on the mountain. You're just doing this whole thing. And you don't know that because the sign fell over and you don't get warned. Other person warned you knowledge without action what's the action i slow down i go around the curve slowly right otherwise you're going to go careening off the cliff we can know critical race theory intersectionality wokeism materialistic evolution baby murder we can know all these things are wrong but until we actually act on them we actually act accordingly tweeting about it, putting on Facebook, challenging people in our workplace, in our churches, telling people, hey, that's a bad book. You shouldn't read that. You should read the Bible. You should read this. This is actually explaining what's going on in the text of scripture, not some newfangled ideology, being captivated by human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ, Paul says. So we should be captivated by the philosophy of Christ. So again, I hope this finds you well. Longer video. I know y'all like video, longer videos sometimes. Um, hope this was helpful. Again, feel free to you know rewatch it or watch it on fast mode. I'll... But no, I appreciate this. I hope this finds you well. Um, again, this is being against the world for the world. I'm helping you do that. Ultimately, everybody should care because you want to have faithful people. I mean, just look at somebody like a James Lindsay, who's an atheist. I think he's more of an agnostic, but he knows that wokeism and critical theory and all this stuff is garbage. And he wants the churches to be the churches. If he's going to disagree, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a Baptist, I don't really care. Okay, he has the freedom to do that. Well, ultimately, not just in the U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, but from God, right? God doesn't force anyone to believe. Rather, he woos them, he calls them. He says, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, now we'll give you rest. Y'all have a great day. Be against the world. We'll see you.